I want to begin today with a little audience participation. You can think of it like a pop quiz. Didn't you used to love those in school? I used to hate pop quizzes. But you know, this is easy one. You're going to all do very well in this one. I can almost guarantee it. So this pop quiz is about great love songs of the 20th century. Okay, here's how it's going to work. I'm going to give you a decade, and then I'm going to give you the title of a song that was popular in that decade, and I want you to give me the name of the singer or the artist or the group that made that song famous. Okay? It's, it's easy. You're going to do well. It's only four questions. All right? The decade was the 1940s. What? <laughs> the 1940s. The title of the song is Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree with Anyone Else But Me. Who, 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 who made it famous? The Andrews Sisters. There we go. Ten points for you, Bill, and whoever else got that right. Second question, the decade is the 1950s. Title of the song is Love Me Tender. <laughs> Elvis Presley. A lot of Elvis fans out there. Decade is the 1960s. Title of the song is I Want to Hold Your Hand. <laughs> the Beatles, of course. And then the decade of the 1970s. The title of the song is Love Will Keep Us Together. The Captain and Tennille. Now, if you knew that one, you should be very embarrassed, <laughs> as I am for thinking of it and putting it in this little quiz. Now, of course, I could have gone on and on. We could go on and on to the 80s and 90s into the 2000s because the love songs really never stop, do they? I could have done a whole quiz just on the television shows we've watched, as Kenton said, throughout our lifetimes, from the Honeymooners to I Love Lucy to the popular show now, This Is us and dozens of others. We live in a culture, a world really that's fascinated by, obsessed with love. But at the same time, so many seem so confused about the very nature of love itself. We're in our series from Ephesians now, nearing the end, just one more week next week, in a series called Built to Last. And Paul began this beautiful ancient letter, powerful ancient letter, with a focus on the gospel, how in Christ we have been moved from spiritual death to spiritual life. We've been given new identity. And then he moves to the church, how these people groups who were at war with each other in many ways, the Gentiles and the Jews, have been joined together through Christ into one new body, one new family called the church. And then he begins to teach us how the gospel shapes all of our lives and relationships. Last week, we looked at how Paul says we are to put off our old selves, our before Christ selves, and put on the new self, the, 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 the identity that Christ has given us as we've been made new, how we are to avoid things like greed and impurity, how we are to put off falsehood and speak truthfully, how we are to deal with anger in appropriate ways, not because we're trying to earn the favor of God, but because we already have received the favor of God. We've been made new. We've been given a new identity. And now Paul is beginning to apply the gospel to our understanding of marriage itself in chapter 5. Now I want to be careful here. I know some of us in this room are married right now. Some of us are not. Some of us uh, are no longer married or have not yet married, and some actually may never marry. And we need to be careful in talking about marriage because even though marriage is God's idea and marriage is one of His great gifts to us, marriage is not in and of itself the center of his purpose for our lives. It just isn't. The central purpose of life is to know the power of the grace of Christ and his love for us. That's the gospel. And it's perfectly possible to live a fulfilling and joyful and fruitful life without being married. After all, the Apostle Paul himself, most scholars believe at the writing of this letter of Ephesians, was not married. We know that Jesus himself never married. And many pastors and missionaries have had productive, fruitful, fill, full lives and been single all their lives. And yet Paul does want the Ephesians to know and he wants us to know that the gospel does shape and change 
how we think about and how we experience marriage. So we're in Ephesians 5 today, beginning in verse 21. So I'm going to read these verses to you, comment a little bit, and then we're going to try to unpack them for see what God has to teach us today. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 21. Paul writes, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And as always, I've put some of these words in red. This is um, kind of my way of dealing with Scripture to kind of show you points of emphasis. And that then becomes the outline for our teaching today. Uh, this verse actually sets the context for all Paul is going to say in, in what follows. He's connecting what came before, which was last weekend, when Paul tells us to put off the old self, put on the new self, how we are to live out our new identity in Christ, allowing the love and grace of Jesus to shape and change our behavior and our relationships. And he's connecting that to what comes next, which is how the gospel is to impact marriage. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Let me pause there. Uh, He says it this way because of an ancient Roman law uh, in that culture that was referred to as the pater familias. Simply meant that the father had absolute rule over his family, including adult daughters, even if they were married. And so some of the wives at that time were confused. Who is it that's primary in our relationships, our fathers or our husbands? That's why he says your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now let me, see that, let me say that pastors and teachers often stop right here. But we're not going to stop here, because Paul doesn't stop right here. He continues, verse 25. Husbands, Love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body." For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. We begin today with uh, two assumptions that help us make sense of this teaching. First is that marriage is God's own idea. We see this way back in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis in the second chapter, when we read, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So marriage is God's idea. That's an assumption we have this morning. Secondly, we assume that marriage is between a man and a woman for life. We all know there are lots of ideas about marriage out in our culture today, around in the world. But we begin with the assumption here that, biblically speaking, God's design is for marriage to be between a man and a woman for life. First thing we see in this text, Paul's teaching us, is that marriage is shared submission. Marriage is shared submission. We used to have this stuff in our house called Gorilla Glue. Um, Anybody have this in their house? Anybody have Gorilla Glue? (laughs) Okay. Um, something must have broken in our house. I don't remember what. And so I go to the hardware store, and I see this stuff. And if you can see the, the, the little slogan there on the Gorilla Glue, it says, for the toughest jobs on planet Earth. So I bought some. Because it claims to be able to bond anything. It bonds wood, stone, metal, ceramics, even glass. We don't have that in our house anymore because I discovered it also bonds skin. If you're not careful, and I'm not very careful. Paul is teaching us here that the gorilla glue of marriage is Christ. Now, if you stop to think about it, one of the toughest jobs on planet Earth is the bond of marriage. I came across some interesting research fairly recently by a marriage counselor named uh, Shanti Feldhahn. She uh, reports, after extensive research, that the divorce rate in America, 
is about 35% of the, a lot of times we hear the 50% thing thrown around there. That's kind of a legend. It's not really true. It's, it's a right around 35% of marriage and divorce. But what she's found is that for couples who are actively connected to a church, and the way she defined that was, was in worship last weekend. That's the research. That divorce rate drops by almost half just by being in church last weekend. Gorilla glue for the toughest jobs on planet Earth. In Ephesians 5, Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There are two surprises in this simple sentence. First, the key to marriage, in Paul's view, is not better communication. It's not more romance. It's not how the other person makes makes me feel or how they meet all my needs. The key is submission out of reverence for Christ. Now, what does that mean? Paul is saying that before you can love someone else, you must be surrendered to the love of Christ. That's the glue. And this is the gospel. Paul has already outlined it for us, beginning in chapter 1 in Ephesians. We were chosen and adopted by God the Father. We were redeemed, that is, paid for, purchased by the blood of the Son. We've been sealed by the promise of the Holy Spirit. Then we are filled, he says, chapter 3, with the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It's a promise. Let me be clear. You don't become a Christian by being born into a Christian family. You don't become a Christian by going to church. You don't become a Christian by being a really, really, really good person. You become a Christian, the Bible says, by hearing the gospel, By believing that by his death and resurrection, Jesus forgives your sin and gives you the hope of eternal life, and that then you are sealed by the promise of the Holy Spirit who dwells in your life. And once we surrender our hearts and lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit then begins to shape our attitudes and our behavior, helping us to put off the old self and put on the new self And that includes our understanding of marriage, Paul is saying. That's the first surprise. The second surprise is that submission is mutual in marriage. Submission is mutual. That is, Paul is saying that as followers of Jesus, as husbands and wives, we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submission is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. Years ago, um, we were, when our boys were quite young, we were sitting at the family dinner table, as I recall, and out of nowhere, one of our boys, who was probably like six at the time, I I can't even remember which son it was, uh, right at the dinner table says, uh, just uh, totally unexpected, says, uh, Dad, who's the boss of our family? And it came as a surprise, so I really wasn't prepared for an answer. So before I could say anything, another boy jumped in and said, Dad's the boss. And to which the first boy who started the conversation said, well, then so what's Mom? And this whole time I'm trying to formulate an answer in my head. And before I could cough up like, well, uh, boys, uh, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians teaches that your mom and I have kind of a mutual partnership. The other boy pipes up and says, Mom's the queen. And so I just sort of left it right there. (laughs) It's a good place to be. It wasn't bad. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, Paul says. Now, we don't much like this word submit, if we're honest, because it sounds like a kind of heavy-handed authority. Submit. Like, allow yourself to be pushed around. Allow yourself to be, you know, uh, beaten up a little bit. But that's really not what he's talking about here. The word here, submit, means to place under to put yourself under another, to lay aside your need to have your own way. That's what it means. Now, there were actually two words Paul could have used in this sentence. One word meant a kind of mandatory submission where you have no choice, like what a soldier does to a commander, or like a slave to an owner. The other word, the word he actually uses here, carried the meaning of voluntary submission, a continual, voluntary submission, a willingly placing another before yourself. That's the word he uses. Now, we read this and we hear things like this a lot of times, and we're like, yeah, 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 you know, Bible talk, we're supposed to be nice to each other. 
but it's more than that. This is the very foundation of Christian life. In Philippians chapter 2, in another one of his letters, Paul writes, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by become obedient, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's what submission looked like in Jesus. A continual, voluntary submission to the will of the Father. And we are to submit ourselves in the same way, Paul says. He continues in Philippians 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, here it comes, value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, this sounds simple enough, doesn't it? But if we look out there at the landscape of our culture and our world, and if we look at the condition of marriages and families in our neighborhoods, is this not one of the great problems of human life? The failure to put others before ourselves, the failure to consider others' needs before we consider our own. Notice here, Paul begins this entire teaching section on marriage by talking about our relationship with Christ. So often we want to jump into the marriage discussion. We want to talk about the role of the husband, what's the role of the wife, who who does what, who's in charge. But that's not what Paul wants to talk about first. He wants to talk about Jesus first. Only when we understand our relationship to Christ can we begin to understand our relationships with each other. So marriage begins, Paul says, with reverence for Christ. Then it moves to mutual submission. Second thing we see in Paul's teaching here is marriage is also a shared devotion. A shared devotion. My brother Joe, who's pastor in Ohio, uh, likes to tell a story that came out of the very early years of his marriage with his wife, Karen. As I recall the story, they were in their first year of marriage, Uh, living in Florida where he was a youth pastor of a small church. I think they were expecting their first child. Uh, And they uh, had their their first little little two-bedroom home in a little neighborhood there, and one evening they took a walk after dinner. And the way he tells the story, the sun was setting, there was kind of a coolness in the air, and he was walking hand-in-hand with the love of his life. It was just perfect. And then, without warning, completely unexpected, a large dog bounded out from behind the hedge of another yard with no leash on this dog. A large dog, a huge dog, barking and growling and acting like he was going to tear him limb from limb and charging straight at them. My brother says the dog so startled him that before he could even think, he leaped behind his wife shouting, big dog, big dog, and used her as a human shield. And then he recovered, but it took him years to live that down. And they've been married some 37 years now. But it's a great story. In verse 22, Paul says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Now, we're tempted to stop here, as I said before, and many do, and they start with, okay, ladies, here's the deal. I actually had a man call me on the phone one day. I was in my office, and he called me on the phone. He did not attend his church, although his wife was starting to come here, and he called me to get me to tell his wife to submit to him. Okay? It didn't take me very long on the phone to discern that he was a kind of angry, controlling, my way or the highway kind of guy. He just was. And so I, uh, he actually quoted the, Ephesians 5.22 to me. It says right in God's word, she should submit to me. Tell her to submit, pastor. You know the word, don't you? And it, may, it made me kind of mad. So I 
gently ask him, uh, do you happen to know what uh, the previous verse, verse 21 says? Silence. I said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Silence. I said, do you happen to know what it says after verse 22? Silence. See, his idea of marriage was based on power. It was based on authority. It was based on control. And that's not what Paul is talking about here. I don't think we can even begin to understand what he's saying to wives until we understand what he's saying to husbands, which is what comes next. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He says so here. And gave himself up for her. Do you know what that's talking about? That's talking about the cross. That's how Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now let me ask you, in the Apostle Paul's mind, which of the marriage partners carries the heavier burden? Wives, respect your husbands. We'll talk about respect in just a moment. Husbands, love your wives to the point of sacrifice. Now, we, we struggle to hear the absolutely revolutionary and countercultural view of marriage Paul is giving here. In the ancient Roman world, uh, the culture into which he was writing, we had this thing called uh, pater familias. That is where men had absolute control and all the power. They held legal authority over their entire family right up, into, up to life and death. Women were considered more or less property, first of their fathers, then of their husbands. It was not uncommon for a man to keep a wife for the bearing of legitimate children and then to have many, many mistresses for his companionship and pleasure. It was common. So Paul is painting a revolutionary picture here, a picture of shared submission in which both husband and wife willingly consider each other's needs before their own, willingly serve each other, willingly put their own desires behind those of their partner. Revolutionary. Shocking to husbands of the day. A picture of what I would call shared devotion or commitment. Wives are to express that devotion, their voluntary submission through respect. Verse 33 says, however, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, what is respect? It seems to me there are two kinds of respect. One kind of respect for position or authority, and another kind of respect we offer to persons, to people. For example, um, I got pulled over in a rental car in Florida a couple weekends ago uh, because I, I was driving at night because I didn't have my lights on. I, d- I thought they were automatic, they weren't on, so this policeman pulls me over. And I pulled over as soon as I saw the lights because I respect the position, the authority, right? I don't know the guy. I don't know anything about him, but I pulled over. That's respect for authority and position. Respect for person is something different. That respect is admiration. If I admire someone of great competency, and I give them my respect. Respect is about trust. I may admire someone's competency, but if I also know they are, have high character and integrity, I will trust them. So this kind of respect is anchored in the character of the one who is to be respected. Hold that thought for a moment. Paul then says that husbands are to express their devotion, their commitment through Love, verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. See that last part? Gave himself up for her. That's why my brother still remembers the big dog. Because he failed to give himself up. Paul's talking about a love that is sacrificial. A husband is to love his wife by stepping in front of her to take on the big dog, right? Right? 
That's what we know is love. A husband gives himself willingly to protect and to nourish. Paul is saying a wife is not something a husband owns. To be discarded at will. To be disrespected at will. A wife is a person for whom you would willingly lay down your life to serve, protect, and nourish. Question, what does a wife feel toward a husband who loves like that? Respect. Respect. Here's what I think. Why does Paul use different words to describe the devotion of husbands and wives? Here's what I think. is because men and women are different. Now hear me carefully here. Men and women have absolutely equal value and worth before God. Absolutely equal. But we are marvel- marvelously different in so many ways, including our deepest emotional needs. That's why the currency of manhood, I like to say, is respect. The currency of manhood is respect. That's why some episodes of road rage happen. You get cut off in traffic, you feel disrespected. It makes you angry. You want to fight. That's why men don't much like unsolicited advice. They feel like they're being disrespected. That's why job loss is devastating for a man. It feels like disrespect. I don't even like it when the lady on my phone tells me where to turn. You know? <laughs> what most women deeply need is love and security. Now, I want to be careful here. I'm not saying that women don't need respect. They do. I'm not saying that men don't need love. They do. What I am saying is that men tend to feel loved when they're respected, and that women tend to offer respect when they feel loved just goes to how we're created. See, respect and love are like Velcro. You know how Velcro works? It's two different kinds of surfaces on two different kinds of fabric. They're two, if you can see it under a microscope, they're different. But you stick them together, and they stick because they're different. Husbands love, wives respect. And then we see here, thirdly, Paul teaching us that marriage is a shared covenant. A shared covenant. In our, throughout our 32-year-old, 32-year marriage, my wife and I have given many different anniversary gifts back and forth. And over those years, I've given some, some pretty good ones, actually. Surprised her once with a baby grand piano. Thumbs up. Worked. Trip to Mexico one time. Worked. And I've given some uh, less than awesome gifts. On our 13th anniversary, I think it was our 13th anniversary, my wife gave me a beautiful framed calligraphied version of our wedding vows. Framed, glass, calligraphied, every word we said at our our, our wedding house. Beautiful. That same anniversary, I gave her a three-quart iced tea maker. (laughs) Three quarts. (laughs) But the reason my wife's gift was meaningful is that it reminded us of the covenant we had made with each other. Verse 31, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, Paul does not use the word covenant here, but that's what he's talking about. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. That word he uses, be united to, means to cleave to, to join closely, literally to be glued to another. To be glued to another. Covenant means holy promise. The first promise is the holy promise of exclusivity. Exclusivity. Ancient Roman culture, in that, in that culture, promiscuity was, was common. In our modern-day culture, 2,000 years later, promiscuity is also very common and even celebrated in our culture. But it's something I noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed it too. If a famous person, a celebrity, a politician, a movie star, whatever, um, is exposed for having an affair outside of their marriage, our whole culture collectively goes, no, naughty, naughty, no, no. So on the one hand, we celebrate promiscuity, but on the other hand, we all know, we know that it's a violation of our relationships. We all know that it's a violation of a promise, a covenant, and we all long for the covenant of exclusivity. We all know. And then after that promise comes the promise of 
intimacy, and the two will become one flesh. First comes the covenant of exclusivity. That's safety. Then comes the promise of intimacy. Our culture gets that absolutely backwards. And so Paul's teaching is revolutionary, even for us today. I think what Paul most wants us to know here in Ephesians chapter 5 is that the center of this teaching is not wives submit. The center of this teaching is not husbands love. He wants us to see that the center of his teaching is Christ. That's the center. He says in himself, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Husbands, submit by loving like Jesus loves. Wives, submit by respecting like Jesus respected the Father's will. That's what it looks like, he says. Many of you have probably heard and seen the story of a man named Robertson McQuilkin, the late Robertson McQuilkin. He was president of a major Christian university and a seminary a number of years ago. Uh, but while he was at the peak of his career, his wife Muriel was diagnosed with early onset of Alzheimer's disease. And it progressed rather rapidly. He had to give more and more of his time and energy to her care, eventually um, resigning his position as president of a university just to full-time care for his wife. And one day they were traveling somewhere. He had a speaking engagement, took her along, and they were in an airport in a gate area waiting for a flight. And he, the whole episode was happening where she was confused and would ask question after question, why are we here, what, where are we going, what time is it, what day is it? And he would answer the questions patiently every time, question, over and over again questions. There are people sitting around in the, in, in, in the gate area, one of them being a, a woman who was a uh, professional businesswoman, maybe an executive at a company, an attorney or something, working on a laptop computer, she was seeing all this. And Muriel kept getting up and wandering away. He'd get up and walk after her and gently bring her back to her seat. And it happened over about a half an hour period of time. Finally, as he was uh, following after her one more time to get her, and he walked by this businesswoman, and the woman sort of mumbled something to herself, and he heard her and thought maybe they were troubling her by the constant movement. And he said, oh, I'm sorry if we're disturbing you. She said, no, 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 it's not that. She said, I was just wondering, will I ever find someone to love me like that? She said. It's a beautiful story, and I think the Apostle Paul would say, that's what I'm talking about. That's the mystery. That's the beauty of marriage. That's the power. That's what it looks like, he would say. Will you bow with me as I close today? Lord, we thank you for your word today, for this beautiful teaching that was counterculture and transformative 2,000 years ago and is countercultural and transformative today. We know there is confusion in our world about both love and marriage. We know there's brokenness and pain in many marriages. But remind us today of the power of submission, first to your love for us and then to each other and in all of our significant relationships, especially in the gift called marriage. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.